Let us pray and uh, let's look at this section in Genesis chapters 45, 46, and a section from 47, the beginning of 47. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a new time when we can sit together, we can speak together, and we can marvel at the beauty of your word. We pray that you will bless us and guide us to the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We finished last time with Judah's discourse in front of Joseph. Judah, the same guy that some years back, more than 10 years back, was the one that came with the brilliant idea, let's sell him into slavery. This time, after he promised his father that he will bring Benjamin back, he's the one that wants to be the pledge for Benjamin. And when Benjamin seems to be in trouble, he goes to Joseph and says, if the boy doesn't go back to my father, my father will die because his life and uh, the boy's life are intertwined. And instead of him, please allow me to stay. That's a beautiful discourse and attitude on the part of somebody about whom we did not have a very high regard. He was not a very nice guy before. But Judah changed. So now he intervenes for Benjamin. And what is interesting is that at one point, verse 1 in 45 says, Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out. And then he weeps. So it seems that as a reaction to Judah's discourse, Joseph reaches a, an emotional state where he cannot hold it back any longer. He kind of breaks down. Now, you may think, okay, he finally breaks down and he stops the torturing. Who knows what else he had in mind? Maybe he had some other things planned to test his brothers. We don't know, really. What we know that at one point he says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just let it out. And he cries, he weeps. If you look at Joseph's life, you will notice he's quite a weeping guy. There are several moments, like seven moments in his life when he weeps. I even took some notes, and uh, I want to show those moments. So he first weeps when his brothers come to Egypt for the first time. Not in front of them, but he weeps. Then he weeps when uh, he sees Benjamin. Then again, he weeps here when he makes himself known to his brothers. Then again, at one point, he weeps with Benjamin on his uh, neck and his brothers as well. Another moment when he weeps is when he sees Jacob, because Jacob will come down, so he weeps again. 
Then when uh, Jacob dies, his father dies, he weeps. All Egypt cries along with him, the text says. And again, at Jacob's death, at the burial, if I remember correctly. But there are some other moments when you would expect him to weep, and the text doesn't mention he was weeping. For instance, when he's thrown in the pit, he's thrown into the pit, and it's not mentioned he weeps. Or when he's sold into slavery, again, it's not mentioned that he wept. When he becomes the slave of Potiphar, so he's sold again practically, again, no mentioning. When he's framed by Potiphar's wife and he's thrown into prison, it's not mentioned that he wept. Then uh, when uh, the cupbearer forgets him, it's not mentioned that he was sad and uh, wept. He has moments when he's afraid, he's uncertain, probably even angry. He's stressed out, but he does not weep. At least the text doesn't mention it. There is a specific context, however, when he weeps. Can you now indicate what is the specific context when he weeps? It's always a family context. It is always when he sees somebody that is dear to his heart. His brothers first, then Benjamin, then his father. So it seems that for him, his family really is important. And uh, I'm just emphasizing this because uh, men, they say, have a harder time to weep. They would not allow themselves to weep. It seems that Joseph, the second in commander of Egypt, doesn't have that problem. When it's time to weep, he just weeps. And uh, that is pretty resilient, I would say. There are times, there are moments in our lives when we do need to weep. Women and Man. Okay, so let's go to the story. The story in uh, chapter 45 starts with Joseph asking everybody to leave. And then, verse 3, Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? He comes and tells them he is Joseph. You can imagine how frozen they are. And then he says, please come near to me. And they come nearer, and he repeats, yes, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. There we go. I can imagine the brothers, when they heard this, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt, Okay, now it's coming. And it's not coming. Because the way Joseph continues is just amazing. Verse 5. But now do not therefore be grieved and angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. That was verse 5. And then in verse 7 and 8. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh. Try to wrap your mind around that concept. Joseph becomes a father to the Pharaoh. 
and Lord of all his house, and the ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. And again, verse 9, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and don't tarry. This is amazing to me because what Joseph says is that everything that happened to him was actually God. Now, how can you even get to that conclusion? Because you feel like uh, in a cognitive dissonant reality that everything bad they did to him was actually orchestrated by God. Is that the case? Well, I believe in order for us to get the right meaning of Joseph's words, we should also read chapter 50, verse 20. This is what Joseph says later. This is after Jacob passed away. But as for you, you meant what? Evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people's life. So we have two components here. One is a component of evil. And then God, who means, or if you want, transforms evil into something good. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. I'm uh, bringing this out for a reason. It can happen in life that you treat somebody badly, and then God takes your evil act over and uses, uses that evil act as a springboard, if you want, for somebody to prosper. Then you would look at that person that prospers after he jumped on the springboard of your evil deed. And you would say, oh, see, you got there because I helped you. But that's not the case. They did not help him at all. They meant evil. And evil is evil. Of course, evil can be forgiven. But that was evil. Now, how God can take that evil and transform it, turn it around, and bring something great out of it, that is a different discussion. And that's what is happening here with uh, Joseph and his brothers. So Joseph treats them nicely. At this point here, Please notice, when he has this first open interaction or encounter with them, he doesn't even mention the evil. He doesn't mention the evil. Later on, when they are already in a much closer relationship, they are in Egypt, they have been together for quite some time, that's when he openly speaks to them about their evil and then how God turn things around. In this discourse here, you have the impression Joseph is not even aware of the evil they did to him. I think he is aware, but he doesn't mention it. It's not the time. He waits, and later on, he clarifies the situation with them. So, the story goes on. Joseph tells them, go home, bring my father down here, and he sends carts it's a whole fleet of uh, limos. He sends the limos to bring his father and uh, the families of uh, his brothers down to Egypt. He lets Pharaoh know about uh, his brothers. Actually, verse 16 says that the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house. So somebody told even the Pharaoh Hey, Joseph's brothers came down here. So it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. It seems to me from this expression that it pleased Pharaoh that he knew 
probably knew something about what was going on with Joseph. Maybe Joseph told him the story. Hey, I was sold into slavery by my brothers. I don't know. But um, Pharaoh and uh, his servants are supportive of Joseph. They come uh, uh, back to their father, to the land of Canaan. Now, notice this as well in verse 22. Before Joseph sends his brothers back home, he gives Benjamin 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments instead of just one change of garments because each one received one, but this guy received five. So again, he treats Benjamin preferentially. And then when they are about to leave... He tells them, see that you do not become troubled along the way. Because he knows now they have motives to get troubled. Because as long as they were down there with Joseph, they could not afford starting the conversation. But now on the way back, they can start. Reuben can say, didn't I tell you guys? And they can go to Judah, hey, it was your idea. Or uh, take Simeon, or Simeon, because he's the second now in the row after Reuben. Hey, why didn't you step in? And he can say, hey, I uh, paid my punishment. I stayed in prison for all of you guys. And then why did Benjamin receive five changes of garments and not one? So they had plenty of human reasons to fight on the way back. Joseph tells them, See that you do not become troubled along the way. When they tell Jacob what happened, beautiful expression, verse 26 in chapter 45, and Jacob, Jacob's heart stood still. Can you imagine that? Can you see the diagram of his uh, heartbeat? It's beating normally. And then at one point, it's a very, very interesting Hebraic way of saying he was in shock. He could even die of heart attack because his heart stood still. He couldn't believe. Who would have believed that what they were telling him was accurate, was true? Because if it was indeed true, then what kind of children does he have? So the text says that only after they told him everything that Joseph said, and he saw what? The limos lined up. You know, he said, oh, wow, this, this must be true. This is enough, he says at one point, the last verse of 45. Joseph my son is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. And uh, he starts the journey down to Egypt. He probably has some doubts or questions because verse 3, chapter 46 says that God appeared to him in vision. So he did not reach Egypt yet. But God appeared to him in a vision, and God said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation. And there's a word important here. There. I will make you a great nation there. And then God says something else. Verse 4. I will go down with you to Egypt. Oh, that's remarkable. So God reveals to Jacob in a vision that he himself is going down with him to Egypt. Isn't that beautiful? It's amazing because God says, hey, you're going down. I'm with you. I'm going with you. You will be under my protection there. I will keep blessing you there. And, and then here... We have a description 
of the whole family, a genealogy kind of description of the entire family. That's why I said that this is practically the focal point of this chiasm. It points to Israel. It points to the whole family of uh, Jacob, of Israel, as God protects them and preserves their lives because of Joseph down in Egypt. And uh, you know the number of these people? How many of them were? Total of 70, 70 men, it seems. If you count Joseph and his two sons as well. If you do the math, because you have, uh, first you have Leah, then you have uh, Zilpah, then uh, Rachel, and then Bilha, and all four branches of the family together add up to 70, if you count in Joseph and his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Okay? So those are the people that go down to Egypt. Joseph teaches his brothers what to tell Pharaoh, because Pharaoh will ask them, what is your occupation? What do you do? How do you work for a living? He tells them how important it is for them to tell uh, Pharaoh, we are shepherds, we do cattle and uh, sheep and uh, just raise animals. And why is that important? Because they are not really loved in Egypt, but there is a benefit coming with that. If Pharaoh will hear that you are shepherds, he will not bring you to the capital. He will send you somewhere out where there is pasture and uh, plenty of food. It is like uh, if you want about this area, you will not be brought into L.A. He will send you maybe to Napa Valley somewhere where you can continue your life unhindered. The story goes on. Jacob meets the Pharaoh. And verse 7 in chapter 47 says that Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh asks him, how old are you? How old was Jacob at this time? 130, correct. And he says, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my father's in the days of their pilgrimage. I would like to emphasize this aspect here that Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the king of uh, Egypt. The first man, well, actually not even man, because he was regarded as God. The Pharaoh was assimilated to the gods in their eyes. And here comes a man of God and blesses the Pharaoh. Hmm, is that normal? We have a tendency to believe that everybody that is high-ranking in politics is straight from the devil and therefore we should have nothing to do with them, not speak to them, Maybe just vote for them if 
even that, but don't care about them. And that's not the right position, I believe. Jacob, the man of God, the father of the one whom God made to be the father of the Pharaoh, blesses the Pharaoh. If, say, one of these days, Joe Biden is in the area and uh, you will see me in a picture or in a video blessing him, then uh, some uh, crucifixion can also happen after. I said Biden because uh, he's the president now. Could have said the same about Trump and then some other people would have uh, crucified me. You understand where the problem is? I believe the right attitude is to acknowledge that no matter how high-ranking somebody is in politics, they still need God's blessings. Are they good or bad people? Who am I to decide, really? Can I agree with what they do or with everything they do? Not really. Should that uh, stop me from blessing them? See, Jacob blessed the Pharaoh. And, uh, of course, you could uh, extrapolate or infer from the text or without the text that at this stage Pharaoh was closer to Yahweh worship. We don't know how close he was to Yahweh worship, worshiping the God of Jacob. Of course, we see wisdom in him by the fact that he accepted Joseph to be the second in command, which in fact, knowing now that he is also the ruler of his house, the king's house, and God made him father of the Pharaoh, Joseph is higher than the Pharaoh. Right? But we don't know what is going on in Pharaoh's heart. Fact is, wherever you are, as a man or woman of God, be a blessing to those that are in need of blessing. Questions? There are different studies and theories, but I cannot point with certainty to the name of the Pharaoh because it's not mentioned in the Bible. And Something is important to take uh, into consideration when it comes to pairing biblical account with historical accounts. This is what happens usually. If uh, there are people that do some digging and they discover some of the names that could possibly be on the throne in those days, then they will take the historical records and compare them to the biblical records. And if the biblical record doesn't match the historical record, please tell me which one they will discard. The biblical. As if the biblical record is not a historical record. I believe the right attitude for those that believe that indeed the Bible is God's revelation. Almost without necessarily going into details as to what that means, that the Bible is divine revelation, I believe the right way of going about it is uh, to go to the Bible, and if historical record doesn't match the Bible, Go with the Bible and continue searching, see how historical records will match the Bible. Because beyond being the science of salvation, 
obviously, the Bible is also written as a historical record. The one that wrote the Bible, Moses, in the case of the book of Genesis, he himself being privy to information, historic information, because he did school in Egypt. So this guy is not somebody that came from nowhere and all of a sudden he started writing um, the book of Genesis. Yes, he wrote under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but he had solid knowledge, solid information, because he studied at the highest schools of those days in Egypt. So we have all the right to say that his record is accurate. With regard to who was the Pharaoh, there are different names, but the honest answer is, based on the biblical text, we don't know. Yes. Any other question, dilemma? Why did the uh, Egyptians have a dislike for the shepherds? Good question. Let me read the text. So the text says in uh, Genesis 46, verse 34, you shall say, that's Joseph speaking to his uh, brothers, when Pharaoh asks you, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servant's occupation has been with livestock from our youth even till now. Both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. So the Egyptians had a, a very strong dislike. Because this word abomination can also uh, be translated with loathsome. Something you hate. Why? Hard to say. Some uh, suggest that uh, they had a problem with the animals they were raising. Some suggest that uh, it was like a lower kind of occupation um, regarded by the higher culture of Egypt as uh, being not good enough to square with the culture of um, the Egyptian empire. Fact is, they dislike them. Are they hostile to them? I'm not sure. Because it seems that after they moved down there, they got along pretty well. Of course, that can also be explained by the fact that they were Joseph's family. So who would touch Joseph's family? But later on, after Joseph is forgotten, they are exploited by the Egyptians. They are brought under slavery, and uh, life becomes really difficult to them. So that dislike becomes later exploitation. They were different in many ways. I don't see anything in the text specifically about connections or any kind of connection between their occupation as shepherds and their God. I've heard people say that maybe because of their occupation, they were deemed as uh, not being uh, in the same worship frame as the Egyptians, and that's why they had that dislike, that abomination conception about them. Not too much information about them. And that's, that's what I, I was mentioning, that there is this idea that uh, they used their flocks, their animals, clean animals, those that they could even eat, although they had donkeys as well, 
and donkeys are not clean in that sense. So donkeys are not eatable, edible. So they had those kind of animals as well, probably camels as well. So going in that direction seems attractive. These people are shepherds. They uh, um, raise cattle and sheep, and they do their sacrifices to their, their God because they only have one, Yahweh, and they are different from us religiously. So some people go in that direction. I'm not very comfortable with that explanation. It's more, I think, based only on the text, it's more likely to be something cultural. Diet can be one other aspect, yeah, because we suspect at this stage that they only eat clean food. Although, please remember that Leviticus 11 comes later. Okay, so we are not there yet when God gives them in writing to Israel, gives them in writing what they are allowed to eat and what they are not allowed to eat. We have a precedent in the flood story. And after the flood, we have in chapter 9, the book of Genesis chapter 9, a precise divine command with regard to blood, not to eat blood. But the text is not clear at all when it comes to clean and unclean. I know some uh, Seventh-day Adventists would like to read out of those texts there that there was already a clean and unclean differentiation with regard to diet. I'm not saying it's not true. What I'm saying is, no matter how you read the text, it's very difficult to see that in the text. One thing you know at the flood, that there was a difference between what kind of animals Noah took into the ark. There were clean animals, and out of those he took seven pairs, and unclean, and out of those he only took one pair, like two animals. So you can infer two things from there. One is that the clean animals were used by them after they came out of the ark for sacrifice. We know after Noah came out of the ark, he did bring, he built an altar and brought sacrifice to God. Okay, so we have that. And I think it is fair to infer from the text that they sacrifice clean animals. That's why probably they took more of the clean than of the unclean. When it comes to diet, we have nothing specific in the text per se. I'm not saying they did not know the difference between clean and unclean when it comes to eating. I'm just saying that based on the text, it's very difficult to conclude that. Later on in the book of Leviticus, hundreds of years later, in the time of Moses, when God gives them those precepts regarding diet, there, yes, we have clarity. So this is why I'm not very certain of the diet. But it may be that diet was part of their cultural concern with regard to these Jews. There are some passages later on in which... Uh, God speaks to Israel and tells them something of this effect. If you do this and this and this, I will not allow on you any of the sicknesses of, or illnesses of Egypt. So it seems, based on biblical text, that there were plenty of sickness and illness in Egypt. When it comes to diet, there are serious studies 
because if uh, you think about the mummies, you know that they are pretty much preserved in a state close to where they used to be when they died, and uh, they can do accurate studies of what their lifestyle was, if they ate this or that. I could think that some may have been vegetarians, but I don't think there is uh, strong evidence that that was a trend really among them. Well, diet is indeed a strong theme in the Bible. When God creates humanity at the very beginning, he makes sure they know what kind of diet they should have. And when I say diet, I'm not referring to diet as in, I'm on diet, and then I'm going back to something else, okay? I'm speaking about diet as a lifestyle, not just temporary change of uh, uh, nutrients. So, at the beginning, you see God paying close attention to what these people that he created are going to eat, Meat is not among them. Then later on, it seems that as a result of the distortions that appeared, meaning that people started to eat all kinds of things, God steps in and uh, narrows it down, and God says, uh, yeah, out of the animals, this is what you can eat. And he gives some categories there. The ruminating and uh, the split hooves and uh, then uh, the fins and scales for fish and then uh, the legs of uh, some birds. So there are some specifics there that God gives Israel to make a difference between what is clean and what is not clean. But I need to emphasize something there. Even there, it is not health the main reason indicated by the text. It's not healthiness, but rather holiness. So what God says is, do this and this and this, don't do this and this and this, so that you will be holy, not only healthy, without saying that healthy is not part somehow of holy. So you go through the Bible and you will always see that uh, God's people are different, somehow different because they are holy, special, peculiar, even in this aspect of diet. But at this point where we are now with the story of Genesis, what we have very clear is from the book of Genesis, chapter 9, and I would like to read it, verse 3 and then 4. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. And this is that verse that I said we have to be honest with and don't make it say what it doesn't say. Please understand. I don't eat unclean meat, okay? So I'm not uh, losing things that are divinely bound, okay? But this is what says next. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. So the blood commandment or precept or call it whatever you want is clear at this time. So if we are referring to diet, yes, and this is what Daniel, because you mentioned Daniel, is about. Because when Daniel tells uh, the servant of the king, we cannot eat at the table of the king because the word he uses there in Daniel chapter 1 is blood defilement. Yes, again, we would easily say that uh, Daniel and his companions did not eat unclean meat either. That is correct to affirm since they were Jews. And Daniel is way after 
Moses. So this is what we have. We have Joseph. We have Moses. We have Daniel. Here at Moses, we already have clean and unclean. Does that make sense? Before that, we may have clean and unclean. What I'm saying is the text does not clearly indicate that. And I'm ready to uh, take uh, any kind of scolding for that. Okay? So here, we don't know. There may be, or maybe some people knew, or maybe it's fair to say that every follower or every worshiper of Yahweh knew. What I'm saying is we don't have clear text. Here at Moses, we do have clear text. At Daniel, of course, since this is after Moses, we do have clean and unclean. But what I'm saying that based on the text in Daniel's case, Daniel doesn't say, please give us some other food, vegetarian food, because we don't want to eat unclean meat. He says, please give us vegetarian food because we don't want to defile ourselves with blood. Because that is the word, that is the wording, which is more or less understandable in translations. So practically in Daniel's case, he goes all the way back to the noatic principle of diet. I'm not saying by that, that they ate unclean meat. What I'm saying is the text doesn't speak about clean and unclean in that particular place. You may think like this. Once I eliminate blood from the equation, I don't even have to deal with the clean and unclean meat problem, which applies even today. If you want to be very practical about what you can eat or what you cannot eat at the restaurant, once you eliminate anything that has blood, either red blood or not so red blood, your problem is fixed. So maybe that was the reasoning of Daniel. So he wanted to make sure because in that context there could be clean meat, but still with blood in it, and clean meat please listen carefully, because that's the Bible, clean meat with the blood in it is the first biblical diet precept in Genesis chapter 9, which says no blood at all. And I think Seventh-day Adventists do not have uh, so much trouble with clean and unclean, as with blood and unblood, non-blood. That's a good question. Whether everything that is red or reddish in a, a piece of meat, and, and here that is probably the most visible in the what we call red meat, right? So everything that is red or reddish is that blood, and there we can debate. What I know, however, from uh, the way the meat industry works is that uh, removing the blood of the meat that they sell on the market is not a priority for that. I'm not here to tell everybody what they are supposed to do. I'm here to raise awareness of what the text says. The text says, but you shall not eat flesh with its life that is its blood. That's it. I believe God always takes into consideration context and what is accepted in a certain context as uh, draining the blood or not. I think God always works with people in a certain setting. But uh, I believe not caring or not taking it into consideration, that may be a problem. And I would uh, put salt on insult. Uh, I believe that also applies to greeds based on some other precepts that come later in the Bible. Good question, practical question. 
you know that uh, Jehovah's Witnesses have uh, a stance against blood transfusion. And uh, their principle, because they take it as a principle, come from some of the verses in the Bible that speak about blood. This specific Bible verse that I read, Genesis 9 verse 4, speaks about life being the blood or blood being the life of a creature, of a being. Based on this verse, and not only, because there are some other verses in the Bible, they have decided it is a matter of principle for them not to accept blood transfusion because that is taking somebody else's life, somebody else's blood being life into my veins. Now, I would not debate their logic on that aspect. I believe what is very difficult to explain away is what Jesus says in uh, Gospel of John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. So to me, giving somebody blood, even if blood is my life, is even less than laying down my life for somebody. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the riddles, the challenges of your word. Some of them we seem to get. Some of them we just don't know. Lord, we pray that you will continue to widen and enrich our spiritual life. In Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit, amen.